welcome to the Vocal Booth Podcast, where we interview voice actors with a special emphasis on those who do audiobook narration. For our first show, please let me welcome David Morantz. David is an accomplished stage, film, and TV actor and voiceover artist. He has appeared in such well-known TV shows as Law & Order, One Life to Live, As the World Turns, and many more, in addition to a long list of stage roles in over 50 audiobook narrations. I'm Peter Reynolds, and joining me today is my fellow aspiring voice actor, Michael Hall. How you doing? David, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So, to start off with, uh, I understand you didn't always want to be an actor. I see you started out with a uh, political science major. What made you decide to uh, move into the acting realm? Um, I don't know. Well, it sort of happened like this. I probably always did want to be an actor, but didn't actually think it was something that I could do, you know? I mean, I was the kind of kid who would amuse my parents and my sister by gagging around the house and playing characters and stuff. But I didn't think it a realistic thing, so I was in a political science in college, and actually, this is how it happened. A friend of mine wanted to get into the theater department at UC Santa Barbara in California, where I went to college, and you had to audition for their acting program. And so my friend, he didn't want to audition by himself, so he asked me to do it too, because he knew I did some theater in high school. So I said, sure, and they let me in. I said, oh, all right. And so I, I got into the theater department and decided I liked it. I mean, it encompasses a little bit of everything. There's psychology. It's very physical. It's very, you learn a lot about people. You learn a lot about different part, different subject matters. You're playing different roles that it, you have to do some research for. It, it had a little bit of everything in it, except the only thing it doesn't really have much in it is uh, money. <laughs> 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 no doubt about that. And that segues perfectly into the, another question about that scene is how you went to college over in California. What made you decide to move back to New York, seeing as how Hollywood would be the perfect place for an actor? Well, you would think. But well, the main reason was I wanted to be a theater actor. I wanted to be the actor with a capital A. That's how I thought of it back then when I was in my 20s. And so... Um, L.A. was such a, you know, in L.A., you're waiting tables and you're working at some restaurant and everybody thinks they're an actor because they know somebody who does headshots and their, their cousin's mother works for a studio. So, oh, I'm going to be an actor. I got a headshot. I'm an actor now. <laughs> Shut up. That is so perfect. I, compl I live in L.A. I completely understand. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and I, so I decided, and I did summer theater one summer up at uh, Santa Rosa, a little place called SRT in the, in, when I was a kid. And I met a friend there who was going to a program out here uh, at Rutgers, and the program was run by a really famous acting teacher, uh, William Esper. And I knew a couple of people from actually who graduated Santa Barbara before me who also went to that same program. And so I applied. I, I mean, I applied to a couple places, but I got into Rutgers. So I came out here specifically to take that conservatory program. And you just ended up staying in the New York area? Yeah. Once I was here, this is where my friends were. This is where any, if I had any contacts at all, they were going to be here now. And this is where, this is where regional theater, which is what I originally thought I was going to do more of. This is where that happens. This is where they cast it out of. Unless right. you're, uh, you know, I mean, they cast some of it out of the West Coast, but even your West Coast theaters, you know, in the uh, ACT in San Francisco, Oregon Shakespeare Festival, all these people, they come out here to have casting sessions in New York. Yeah, New York is a focal point for acting too, but it seems to be more of a, a focal point for stage acting. Yeah, which is what I was into. And I thought once I was here, I wanted to be a stage actor. That's what I was interested in. That's what excited me. And so that's why I stayed in New York. And then I thought, I always thought, well, I'm not going back to LA unless I have a setup, like an agent or some great credits or whatever. And it never really, it just never really happened the way I might have liked it to happen. So I stayed here. Ah. How life tends to be that way. <laughs> yeah, well. Oh, yeah. Do you have a uh, favorite role that you've done? I mean, you've done TV, film, and stage. Is there a particular role that stands out as one of the most memorable? The most memorable things I've done have clearly been on the stage, because most of the stuff I've done on film and TV has either been smaller film projects or smaller roles on, you know, network stuff. Right. Um, although my first real TV role was pretty funny. I had um, taken a class, a theater scene study class, and the guy who was teaching the class, is, he loved theater. He's a theater guy, but his day job was casting for one of the soaps. 
he cast like the uh, day players and, you know, the under fives and all that kind of stuff. So after taking this class and doing a whole bunch of scenes in his class, about three months later, he just called me up and said, well, hey, we got this role, uh, just a day player role on the soap. You want to do it? Do I want to do it? Shut up. Yes, I want to do it. <laughs> so he sends me the script and it was like the lead woman was arrested for something. And she's like the, you know, you know how soap operas are. So she's the big famous woman in the town and she's the rich, whatever she is. And she's arrested. And she's not even, she's arrested pending arraignment. But the scene read like a noir prison drama. And I was the nasty <laughs> screw. And I was treating her like she was doing hard time in Attica. And she hadn't even been arraigned yet, you know. But that's just the way they wrote it. It was hysterical. I mean, when I first read it, I laughed out loud. But, you know, you had to, it wasn't meant to be a comedy. I was going to uh, say, so, how did you keep a straight face? <laughs> well, you know, you read, you read it enough and memorize the lines. And then you get over the giggles. And then you go and do the job and play it the way it's supposed to be. Um, and it, but it was hilarious because, you know, I had lines. I mean, this was a soap opera in contemporary times. And my lines were things like, you think you're the only respectable dame in a joint? I seen people <laughs> like you. You think you're too good for this place, huh? Stuff like that. That must be the I, evil prison guard role. That's, in fact, yes, how it is on my resume. Evil prison. <laughs> he doesn't have a name, so, you know. <laughs> That's brilliant. It's hilarious. Now, you've already stated that you like stage acting over TV, but do you know exactly why it is that you like that? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, a couple, stage acting, theater is the actor's medium. You rehearse it, the director directs it, they build sets, they have lights. And once the show opens, you're performing live and it's the actor, the actor in the audience, the actor and the other actor. That's it. Film and TV is an, a director editor's medium. So they just got to compile a bunch of stuff and then they'll edit together. So you show up on set and you're expected to do your job just like, you know, the lighting guy does his job and the, 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 the sound guys do their job. You just show up and do your job and here's the script. And especially if you're not the lead in the, you know, the, if the movie's not about you. And you're not, you're just showing up for the day to do your bit and split, you know, and it's, it's exciting. It's fun, but it's also chaotic and it's, uh, you know, there's a lot going on on a film set and you really have to focus in and keep yourself together and do your thing. And theater is so much more, uh, it's just an actor's medium. It's, it's, and it's a, you get a through line. You play the story through from beginning to middle to end eight times a week doing a show that often. You also get deeper into a role than you do in film and TV where you may or may not rehearse it much and you just got to do it. Um, you know, on stage, you get to dig deeper. And it's for that reason, I think more fun. Now, speaking about acting in general, a question that we hear a lot, especially from folks that are in the amateur world looking to go pro is, is getting SAG membership and what a chore that can be. Um, here's the thing. There's a lot of ways to do it. The easiest way to do it, and also the hardest way to do it, is to get a job. That's kind of the general impression I got, that uh, in order to get the membership, you need a job. <laughs> but to get the job, you need the membership. So, yeah. So, this is what I, I mean. This, that's how I got all three of my, I had all three union cards. Now there's only two, because SAG and AFTER have merged. However, I got all three of my union cards by wanting to get into the union, this and that, and then finally just, finally getting a job where they had, they hired me as a non-union and then subsequently had to join. So that's how I got into after. In fact, the, it wasn't even the evil prison guard. It might've been the evil prison guard role that I got the role and I was there. And then I was in the dressing room and the, and the after it was after the yeah, soap operas were after and the after rep shows up in the dressing room and says, Hey, you got to join. Uh oh, <laughs> and SAG was the same thing. SAG, they have these things in, I don't know if they have them outside of New York and LA and the major sort of cities. They have these things, I call them pay to play where you pay 35 bucks or whatever. And you have, um, it's billed as educational where you meet a casting director, right? And you audition for them and they critique you. And it's supposed to be a learning experience more than an actual audition. You know, no one's promising you that it's an actual audition, but so you meet these people because the best way to get work is to meet people face to face. Cause there's so many actors and you're think about it from the other end, who are you going to hire? Somebody you've only seen a picture of or somebody you've met in person. So the more of these people you can meet in person, the better your odds are. So I went to one of these things and 
you know, paid whatever I paid to meet the people who cast the smaller roles for Law and Order. Um, and a few months later, I started getting auditions from them. You know, you have, they have to wait. They actually have to wait a special, uh, a certain amount of time so that it's not like they hired you out of that class that you paid for because that would be unethical, right? Right. Right. So, <laughs> so you, take, you pay for the class, you meet the people. A couple months later, they might start calling you in for auditions. And I booked one as a non-union. And then I had the, and at that point I had the, there's the way the law is set up. You have a, uh, you can join a union or not. And after 30 days, if you want to do another job, you have to be in the union. So that's how it happened. There are other ways like people do extra work and get waivers. And I never did that. Um, it's like you're on it. You're doing background on a film as a non-union background and somebody tosses you a, a line say this line and you get a car and you get a waiver or things like that. But I don't really understand that whole scene cause I didn't do it. All I can say is it, it can be difficult. It can be, you know, your lucky day. That's how you get into the union. Your lucky day. So it sounds, like it, 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 sound, it sounds hopeless, but, um, it is. No, I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I know also know a lot of people who don't, belong to the unions and they don't want to belong to the unions because they get lots of non-union work and what do they care oh i did want to comment on this um i was just watching an episode of your off off web series oh yes new episode new episode is up i was just watching an episode and i think it was the new episode um where they're all sitting around and she's trying to explain how they can make things better and fix the situation and making very obvious comments towards the younger man who seems oblivious and then the other guy's like, dude, package. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. That, that's the latest episode. That's the last one we shot. See the big beard I'm wearing? It's because yeah. I, I had been playing Falstaff in uh, Merry Wives of Windsor. Um, oh, man. And, we had, and I told the, the, the writer, the guy who plays Blake, Stephen Bittrick, is also the creator and writer of the thing. And he, he really wanted to shoot an episode. And I said, he said, can you cut your beard? I said, no, I got another performance to do because we were going to go up and perform uh, the play at a festival somewhere in Connecticut because we got invited to. And I said, I got to keep the beard for another couple of weeks. Can't we just wait a couple of weeks and then I'll shave it? And we, no, I want to shoot. I really want to, I really want to keep the momentum going. It's like, all right, I'm keeping the beard. <laughs> beard out of nowhere. And, yeah. Well, and then the thing was, we shared directing duty. So I directed that episode, but then it was sort of left to me to edit that episode. And I have no software editing skills whatsoever. <laughs> so the thing sat on my computer for probably two years before I got somebody to edit it. And we had one last scene that bit at the end with the girl and the dog. We had to shoot that. And then the sound was crummy. So I had to find a friend who had the right software to fix it, make it sound intelligible. So, wow. yeah, that, that episode is like a year and a half old from when we shot it. Wow. <laughs> I feel guilty that it took so long to get it out there, but we got it out there and it's, it's a funny episode. Exactly. So funny speaking episode. of audio, how did you end up getting into book narration and voiceover work? Because you've got a massive list of credits for that. Um, I, you know, I think I got in at the right time in terms of how much the volume of books I've done. It's, it's been three years, three and a half years. Um, and I just. It took me three years to get in. You want to talk about perseverance. I mean, <laughs> people want their SAG card. I decided, because I've been, I've been an actor for a long time, right? I went to grad uh -huh. school. I've been hanging out in New York, do a little regional theater now and again, not very often. Have a theater company that I'm part of in New York City called The Drilling Company. Uh, we do Shakespeare in the parking lot. We do original plays. And we, you know, it's all basically, we do it for free, right? We just do it. Um, to do, to make art. Um, and the occasional other student films and TV roles and whatever. And then my day jobs. And as I got older, it's like, these day jobs suck. <laughs> I can't do this anymore. I can't, I can't, I can't. I have to do audiobooks. I'd wanted to for years. I've known about them for years. Long time ago, before the digital age was so everybody's laptop is a, is a digital workstation. Um, my friend, told me how to get in audio books is you got to make a demo and you got to join this trade organization and demos are back in the day. If you're paying somebody else to do it for you, it's expensive. So I just didn't have, so I, I put that off for years until I finally was working some day jobs where I had some money to spare. 
And I joined a trade organization. It's called Audio Publishers Association, APA. Look it up. It's um, originally, I think, started as an organization for the actual publishers of audio materials. But long ago, they added in narrators into the, into the mix. So you could join as a, as a narrator. And so then they have a yearly convention. They used to do it like one year in New York, one year in L.A., but they seem to do it in New York all the time now. And this is one of these things a friend of mine told me, you have to join APA and go to the yearly conference, and then you'll meet all the people. And so finally I had the money to do it. Well, actually, the, the year I was going to do it, I got cast in a play and went out of town. All right, I have to wait till next year. Waited till next year, I went. And three years running, I went to this every May. I went to the, the conference and had my audiobook narrator friends introduce me to the people who hire them. So I started to get to know people. And at the conference, they have some informational seminars and things. And then meantime, at home, I was practicing on my own. I'd go to the library, get some audio books. There was a woman, her, she's an a, a award-winning narrator. Her name is Robin Miles. And she was uh, teaching a once-a-month free class at the Union. And so I, did, I took her class a bunch of times. And one of the things I learned was, while she was giving everybody a lot of heavy notes and stuff, she didn't tell me much. She gave me a few. I mean, obviously, I'm not, you know, I'm a good actor, but new to the medium of audio. So she had some adjustments for me, but I figured she's not giving me a heavy adjustment, so I must be on the right track. This must be something I should continue to pursue. So I did. I figured, listen, I was bartending, and it was like, in my mind, you can either bartend and pursue this or just bartend. The choice is pretty clear. Well, Either way, I'm just going to be bartending, so let's pursue it. Um, so I went to the, a the APAC, they call it, Audio Publishers Association Conference, APAC, three years running. At a certain point, people assumed I had done a bunch of titles because they kept seeing me around. It's like I hadn't recorded anything yet. And I finally, and I made a demo. The way I ended up making a demo was I, could, I started with my money, making money, buying equipment, buying a microphone, buying an interface, practicing on GarageBand. A downstairs neighbor of mine is a rock and roll engineer, and so he had all the high-end recording gear in his apartment. So I paid him to help me make a demo. Finally got the demo into the hands of uh, Audible.com, and they liked it, and then nothing happened for a year. And then, <laughs> no kidding, oh, your demo's great, we'll get something right. I never, a year later, nothing. Met him again in person. Oh, yeah, I remember you. Why don't you just come in and audition? And I went down to the, the studio out in Newark, New Jersey, and auditioned. Oh, yeah, you're great. We'll have something for you right away. Well, three months later, I got my first book. And then from there, it has just been a gift. They Apparently, somebody likes me, and I keep getting work. Um, okay. so, uh, but that's under the Audible Frontiers label, I guess? Uh, well, they, you go to Audible Studios, and they have different, the different titles have different lab sub-labels on them, uh, I guess. So, I mean, everything I've been doing is out at Audible Studios. Audible has, I live in Manhattan right in new york audible studios has their building their main building in newark new jersey which is a very short pat it's a very short train ride from penn station new york down to midtown new york and the studio was like a two-minute walk away from the train stop so everything i've done i've done out there in their studios and you know some of them are the frontier titles because they're the science fiction novels and some of them are other kind of regular titles i do them all at audible studios i mean i don't know how they do it administratively but that raises another interesting point as looking at your website i was assuming that you did uh, most of your narration work from home i can do them at home and i did a few at, here's how i want to have a home studio so that if i don't want to live in new york anymore i can go move down next to you in virginia i'd probably go closer to the beach but um <laughs> so i i did a i had a home set up but my apartment I put sound treatment on my walls and put sound, treated an area so that the, the microphone sound was dry, but I couldn't block out the outside noise. Right. So, I could so I could only record in the dead of night. And I don't, my, I get tired. My voice sounds like crap in the dead of night. So I didn't do, so I did three books that way and I just, I'm not doing any more until I get a booth. So this past year, I finally got a booth. I got a whisper room. Yeah, I'm so jealous. <laughs> I bought it on Craigslist, dude. I bought it really? on Craigslist for like two grand. Huh. I mean, and yeah, although 
I, I am very jealous. The the if you ever like strike oil or find that million dollar penny in your change or something, the booth to, that I would love to buy is called a Studio Bricks booth. They're made in Spain and they cost, you know, to get a decent the one at least five thousand dollars. You know, maybe ten to get a decent one um, of any size that you could sit in for five hours instead of standing in a phone booth like a if you're just doing commercials or something. Um, but anyway, so I bought my whisper room last May so that I could go to the APAC conference in May and say, Hey, I can record from home now. So I just wanted to have my setup ready and I still haven't recorded from home yet, but I just got on the roster of an audio publishing company called B audio, B E E B audio. They're located, I think in Oregon. And so that they can we, we can do everything over the internet or over the, you know, FTP and everything. And I can record at home and send them files. Right. And so that's, it's been a long time coming, but that is ultimately one of my goals is to be able to work from home. I mean, I like going to the studios because I like having somebody else engineer me because it makes everything go faster. Right. Oh yeah. But if I can, yeah, but if I can work at home, I don't, you know, I can get work from people who aren't centered in New York or I don't have to live in New York myself for that matter. What is your favorite kind of book to record? Um, I don't know. I mean, it kind of book by book because I've read in the different genres are one thing, but the different authors make it or break it, you know. Um, I've gotten used to the Neil Asher books. Now, I just finished The Technician, I told you, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, so that should be coming out soon. Line War is now up on the site. Um, and so as I've carved through all those books, now I know the, uh, most of the story of this universe now. It's all kind of interesting. Each book fills in something that's referred to in some other book, but you don't know what he's talking about. Um, and I've gotten used, so I've gotten used to all the characters and all the style of, of the Neil Asher, but I haven't done that a lot of different science fiction. I like the crime ones. They're good. I like some, a good nonfiction book I enjoy too, if it's a topic that I'm interested in, like upcoming I think I probably won't get around to narrating until January, the way the schedules are. I'm reading a book about Watergate. Oh, and I'm, oh nice. I'm just into that stuff. You know, it's part of my childhood, Watergate. Right. So, um, Ours too. So the Washington Post put out a book where they have a foreword by uh, uh, Woodward and Bernstein. And then they break it up. They break the whole Watergate scandal up into sections. And they describe the time period. Then they, there's some major news articles from the Washington Post of the day. And so it's interesting to, to know from hindsight what it was all about. And then to go back and read the news stories as it was unfolding. And so you know more than the reporter does as you're reading the news stories. Very interesting. It's kind nice. of a cool book. So, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Do you listen to a lot of audiobooks yourself? And if you do, uh, who's your favorite narrator? I haven't listened to a lot of audiobooks. I listened to a lot of audiobooks when I was trying to teach myself how to do it. Um, one audiobook that I listened to that I remember, I really liked the guy. His name was uh, Petrov, Petkov. The book was The Grim Reaper. And let me see. Wait, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull this up on my computer right now because I'm, I'm going to get the whole name and everything wrong. He's in my iTunes, so I'm sitting in front of my laptop. I'll pull it up in two seconds. But I also listened to a bunch of narrators, uh, not a bunch, but I listened to several narrators that I thought, I'm so much better than that dude. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yes. I completely because, yeah. understand that experience. <laughs> Especially because sometimes they get the, the TV, TV celebrities to read the abridged version of some book, right? Um, and the TV celebrities, they're not trained. Here it is. Beat the Reaper is the name of the book. I forget who the narrator is. Uh, Robert Petkoff, I think. Um, and there's a guy. There's a guy who does a lot of. Um, Alan Sklar does a lot of nonfiction business and political stuff. He's got a great voice. You know, he's not a trained actor. He was actually a businessman who got into audiobooks, But he's got a great voice for that sort of stuff. I read. Uh, I listened to him narrate. House of Cards, which was about the collapse of Bear Stearns. And, uh, I mean, I like some of them. I'm friends with a bunch of these people, so I like, and I listen to their clips, like Scott Brick. I listen to some of his clips. Uh, Johnny Heller's great. 
Um, and uh, have you ever met John Lee? I don't know John Lee. Uh, Seems like I should. He's a British uh, actor, and uh, but his he's got a very distinctive voice. He's he narrates uh, a lot of sci-fi too. But oh, I, I, if I could steal that man's voice, I would. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, you know who's the one of the one of the all time great audiobook voices is this guy, uh, George Guidal. Oh, I love George Guidal. Yeah. yeah, he's got an amazing voice. He does. Yeah, he's been doing it forever. He's one of those guys, and he's fantastic. Yeah, he's one of the, he's one of the, he's one of the people when they tell you if you if you're going to get into audiobooks, you should listen to the great people do it. So listen to this guy, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah. So you've shown how you get a lot of your jobs and how uh, how they pretty much have work their way out but what input does the company have in regards to the work as far as like audible and the author and stuff like that or is it pretty much left up to you it depends on the book and it depends on the audio publisher because a lot of places used to use directors so you'd have a narrator an engineer and a director working with the narrator i've never had that and i think as a thing in the industry it has faded out because the money is squeezing from every end um, so I've never worked with a director, but I know uh, for a long time that was the norm and some places still do it. Um, other than that, very little input. It's all me. The only thing that some books, the author wants voice approval, in which case I actually have to submit an audition and I'll, you know, audible, I'll be in an audible narrating something and they'll say, hey, Dave, we need, will you do like two minutes of this audition so we can send it to the publisher they want, you know for for people to audition for it um but most of the time they just call i get an email say hey we got a new book for you all right nice and then yeah and then again audible is who i've done all my work for um other places have other protocols but at audible if they hire a narrator and they like you they pretty much trust you and put it in your hands and 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 tell you to go you know and when you, when you go to the Audible studios, do they just put you in a recording booth and say, go at it? Uh, with an engineer, yeah. They actually, well, I mean, you have to, if the, if the author wants to be contacted, you have to contact the author. Not every author really cares. Um, I contacted Neil Asher once um, to ask him about it. You know, I think it was when I was doing Pray to Our Moon and Shadow of the Scorpion um, to ask him about some of the names and, you know, he filled me in on some of the things that he made up and he filled me in on how stupid I was of some of the things he didn't make up. And I just <laughs> didn't do the research well enough to know that. Um, thank you, Neil. Um, <laughs> and then, and then I think I emailed him one more time and I never heard back from him. So I figure he didn't really, he was okay with it. He didn't care one way or the other. And I've never heard anything bad since in the six books I've done. So I guess, you know, either he doesn't mind or he doesn't care. He's not paying attention. I'm not sure. That kind of answers the next question, which is, do you typically contact the author? And from what you're saying is, the answer to that is, it depends. It depends on if there is a requirement from the author to contact them, or if you need to contact the author to clarify the pronunciation of a word or name or something along those lines. Yeah, it's book by book. And if they give me, if I get the author's email, I will contact the author. Um, if I don't get the author's email, but I have questions while I'm reading the prepping the book, I can sometimes contact the publisher or the agent and the agent or the publisher will contact the author and answer any questions I have, which has happened as well. In fact, there was one, a nonfiction book that there was a really bad sentence that got into the printed version of the book. And I contacted the author and the author was actually kind of grateful. So, oh yeah, yeah, you're right. No, do, do that to it. Make it. Yeah, that's better. And we fixed it for the audio version because um, you think people proofread stuff and sometimes stuff always gets, sometimes stuff gets through. Well, one thing I've noticed is that during narrating, if there's a typo, you'll find it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Especially while you're reading, you just come across, you're like, what, huh? Well, <laughs> but I've had books that were so poorly proofread that not, not just a typo, but it's the wrong tense of a verb or it's the wrong, you, you left out. A, a pronoun or something stuff gets left out whole sentence doesn't make sense I right think and I you have to pretty much about. rewrite it so that it makes sense yeah <laughs> yeah and you know if it's major you got to contact the author and tell them or ask them and if it's minor i just do it because it's for intel it's for listenability you know right right, right. the old the old adage is whatever's in the book you got to read it but if it's going to make it for a poor listener experience you kind of want to fix it you uh it's 
it's your recording process. Whatever you're in that studio, you obviously you don't sit and read like six chapters at a time. What's your typical day for reading? Sure, I do. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. You do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. I'm there. Uh, six hours. I take okay. breaks. Take breaks. But I tend to go like the last. And now I'm reading a a vampire book, which is it's interesting. It's fun. Um, written in the, it's an old back issue book from the nineties. Um, so I'm reading and there's two books in the series, but even when I was reading the technician a couple of weeks ago, go to the studio and start and just go for as long as I can go, like 10 to say one and then take lunch. And then I have a short half of the short second half of the day and go in a couple more hours, try to get. My goal is at least two and a half and hopefully three hours of finished material a day. That's my, that's what I want. And that's kind of at the studios. That seems like about the standard, unless the book is particularly difficult, which sometimes they are. Which obviously means you don't read the book ahead of time. Oh yeah. You're not, the whole thing. Yeah. Like I get a book. Time, and then you I read it book. and then you go in and do it. That's nice. right. I mean, that's why. You know, it looks like, oh, wow, you're making so much money for finished hours. Like, break it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Spread it out. I get yeah. an email. We got a book for you. I download the PDF. I read it through. If it's a nonfiction, I'm making character notes as I'm reading. I usually only read it through once because that's all I have time to do. It'd be great if I could read it through twice. Sometimes right. what I do is I read it through once. I make all my notes. So I'm making character notes. I'm writing down character notes so that I know as much information as I can so I can pick a character voice. Um, looking for words that I don't know how to pronounce and underlining them and making a list so that I can look them up later. And I figure all this stuff out. And then hopefully if I have time, if I'm going to read whatever 80 or hundred pages, I'm going to read that day. I try to scan through to remind myself what I'm up against that day. And then I go in and narrate it. So, you know, if you're recording two hours, if you're recording one finished hour for every two hours, you're on mic, then you're prepping another two hours for every finished hour, you know, that's where all your money's, that's, that's how much money you're making. Yep. So all, you know, I spend a week in the studio and a week at home for that, for that paycheck. Yeah. Personally, it takes me, it takes me about six hours for every finished hour of product. But when I say finished product, that's everything from retakes to editing and EQ and everything else. Well, that's the beauty of it. I don't have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky you. <laughs> Yeah, it's a pain, but it's got to be done. And uh, I actually don't mind it, but it does take me about six hours from start to finish. You know, when, once I sit down and start reading to the point where I'm done with editing and everything else. Well, you got to, the thing you should do, I don't know, do you punch and roll? Do you like, or do you just record everything straight and then edit all out mistakes out later? Uh, you know, I've refined that technique. I tip, what I typically do is I'll, I'll, if I screw something up, I'll stop and redo the screw up. Um, I've tried it both ways. And for me, that just particularly works better. That is the way that is the way to do it. The way to do it is to get good on your pro tools, your keyboard so that you can, um, every time you make a mistake, back it up yep. and uh, roll yourself in and, and then punch record at the end of right before you have to start speaking and just continue on so that your editing process is that much easier. You want to go through and clean your punches to make sure you haven't cut a breath in half or something like that. And speaking of, of the editing process, and you've kind of already answered this, but um, when you're sending in files uh, over the internet, are you sending them just the raw audio? Yes, because the places I work for typically want that. Like if I record something for Audible, they want a clean, raw punch and roll edit. So they, they, want, my, they want my edits nice so that there's no breaths cut in half and stuff like that. Um, and or if I'm doing something for B audio or something like that, as much of the the noises and clicks as I can get out right. on my own. But then they're gonna they're gonna give it a QC, and then they're gonna give and they're gonna send me my corrections, and I'll do a separate session of corrections, and then they'll put the corrections in, and then they're gonna EQ it and master it, and normalize it, and all they're gonna do. I don't have to do it. Oh, that'd be so nice. Yeah, I don't yeah. Re well, and I I know there's there's a, I mean there's I don't even know that if I would be good at EQing and normalization and mastering is just having the right software and being given somebody else's parameters, like, you know, use these parameters right. and run it through the, and run it through this chain. Um, okay. And I, you know, if somebody taught me how to do that. I could do that. I have the, 
Well, I think a lot of people do the, the, the mastering and the normalization in SoundForge as opposed, you know, Pro Tools is great because you have the punch and roll features, but other softwares work better, I'm told, for normalization and mastering and stuff. I've heard a lot of comparisons. Personally, I use Adobe Audition. Um, yeah, both of us. Oh, okay. I think the interface lends itself really well to the narration kind of work. Um, you know, it's got a really robust suite of uh, effects and controls and EQ and just about everything you could want. Oh, yeah. And... But the thing I really like about it is it has a spectrographic view um, that sits below the waveform if you enable it. And it, it's really a different view of the sound. Um, you know, waveform is one thing, but the spectrographic view, for example, if you're talking and a cell phone rings, you can't really pick that out of a waveform. But the spectrographic view, that stands out very, very clearly. Yep. And if you really wanted to, you could go in with a paintbrush tool, paint that sound. And then with another couple of clicks of, of the mouse, you could remove it. Huh. Granted, in most cases, it's easier to do a retake, but that just gives you the idea of how nuanced it is. Yeah. Now, Mike, Mike is, you've got Pro Tools. Have you installed it yet, Mike? I just got it, but I haven't installed it yet. Yeah. Haven't had um, a chance to yet. So, yeah. Mike, uh, let me just ask a oh, question for a sec. Mike, what are you doing in LA? What are you doing out there? Uh, actually, about the same thing that you started doing where I'm doing this on the side and have a day job. <laughs> All right. So I did some background work when I first came out here and I understand the whole SAG after as far as like getting vouchers and all that kind of stuff. But it was just so cutthroat and I was like, oh, you guys are horrible. <laughs> like, yeah. I just want to get behind a mic because I, I, I started out, you know, in music years ago and I did live sound work. And that's why I think the the studio work is great. But there are times when I, I forget because, I mean, live, it's all on your feet and you got to be really kind of quick about it. You know, although nowadays a lot of it's still digital, but uh, studio stuff is a lot slower. It's a lot more tedious, but you have to get really good at hearing all the different frequencies and stuff. Like he was talking about how you can actually get down there in the spectral waveform and really dig out sound. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to do now. What we're trying to do together is, uh, is put together is some audio work. Is your day job engineer based or is it something? Uh, totally just nope. So crummy, just a um, day job. Yeah, crummy day job. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the club. That's good. Yep. I hate being alone with that sort of thing. Oh, oh, you're not. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, um, going back to your recording environment, um, you've got this whisper booth now. And that's something I was looking at, too, in the not too distant past when I was looking at rearranging my recording area. How well is that working? Uh, it's pretty good. It's, I mean, it's pretty good. Yeah. It's not perfect. It's not the best um, because if you were standing next to a whisper room and you closed the door and you talked, it, it's not soundproof. Soundproof is one of the hardest things to right. actually achieve. Yeah. Um, I did a lot of research because I was thinking of building my own booth and then I <laughs> screw it. I saw one on Craigslist. I'll just buy it. I could build one that I could build one better than a whisper room is, but it would be very involved um, and it wouldn't necessarily be disassemblable and portable. Mm -hmm. But it works pretty good because in my apart, I live in New York City, and the th as long my apartment building is fairly quiet, but I'm also in the flight path of LaGuardia Airport, so you don't notice it on a daily basis. You don't notice it in your waking life, but when you got headphones on and a microphone gain gained up, every every minute you hear <laughs> in the background as a plane goes overhead. <laughs> You don't notice it in real life, but now you put cans on your head and you hear it. Yeah. Yep. Or you hear the boiler in the building next door. Just every, it kicks on for about two minutes and then it kicks off. And, and it's just a low rumble in the background. So the whisper room gets rid of all that. You know, it's great. So that I can record in the middle of the day. Which I actually, I've do, been doing a lot of auditions, home self-tape auditions from my whisper room. Right. Um, and it's a good sound. I mean, I put, that's why I put a demo up on the website of something I recorded myself in the whisper room. I saw that. Yeah. So that any prospective publishers who want to check my credentials, uh, can listen to it and see what it sounds like. Yeah. The whole acoustics and, you know, acoustical treatment is something that escapes a lot of people in the amateur world. Um, the, the two big killers are, you know, a bad mic or a poor recording environment. Um, either one of those two will make a bad recording. But it's one of those things that you can teach yourself. You know, when I first started out, I didn't know anything about any of that. And 
as time went on and th- through the wonder of the internet, I was, I was able to teach myself about, okay, reverberation, standing waveforms, early reflections, all that kind of thing. And, you know, now I have a nice dry recording area. Um, Thank um, God for the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know anything about anything until the internet happened. And now the world's knowledge literally is at my fingertips. Yep. It's just there. And all these guys and all these audiophile recording geeks are out there putting up when geeks, I use a loving term geek, um, because they're just out there with so much knowledge, more knowledge and more expertise than I need or could possibly use. But now I know at least what the parameters are and what I'm looking for. Yep. It's there's great. You got a question. There's somebody out there who's probably answered it and put it on YouTube. Yeah. Because there's so many people cause now because of digital saw digital recording, there's so many people, uh, making their own recording studios in their home. Yeah, that's that's that came as a bit of a surprise. I always imagined that it was done out of a studio, you know, in a re- recording booth in a studio. But I've come to find out that a lot of it is done from their own home studios. Well, because there's, I mean, yeah, there's so many, there's publishers around the country. So they can now with the internet, we can, we can all work from our homes and work for all these different people. I mean, yeah. Audible is in Newark. But they have plenty of people who work from their home studios outside of the New York metropolitan area. You know, there's um like, and then there's all these other um, major studios like um, Recorded Books or Audio Go, Blackstone, Tantor. They're all located in different parts. of Brilliance. They're all located in different parts of the country. But if you have a home studio, they'll hire you. Some of that is changing back. I heard some friends of mine saying that. Tantor is now trying to encourage people to go up to their studio in Connecticut, which is, or Rhode Island or wherever it is. It's a bit prohibitive for us living in New York. I want them to hire me living so that I can record in my house. Right. But I don't know. The trend might be changing for them for some reason. I'm not sure. Speaking of uh, recording from home, how do you like Pro Tools? And have you used anything else before that? Um, well, I screwed around in GarageBand. I got... Um, and I got that free one. What's it? Audacity? Yeah. I didn't, you know. Um, but I got Pro Tools again. I bought it on eBay, and I think I bought an educational copy on eBay. Pro, and it's 8 point whatever, 8.6. Um, so it's an old version that I'm using on my old computer that if I ever have to get a new computer, I'm going to have to get a new version of Pro Tools that will work on it, which is sad. Which, or I can buy it. If I have to get another computer, I'll just get a used one that has Snow Leopard on it. But... Again, Pro Tools has more stuff than I'll ever need, but because it's got the punch and roll feature, that's why I think that's why it became sort of a standard piece of software for the audiobook recording. Right. So you can be narrating along, you can hit stop, you can hit the punch, you can set it up for punch and roll where it automatically rewind however many seconds you want and then play you the audio. And then at the point where you stopped it, the audio will cut and the recording feature will come on. So it's like one touch, punch and roll, and you just go back in. And so I think that's why everybody was using it. That's why I bought it. I bought, I bought it because that's what everybody was using. So I figured I, I wanted to be whatever else was on because just to be standardized with everybody who's already doing it. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Now there's a new software. I don't know how new it is. Fairly new called Reaper. Yep. That's very inexpensive in comparison and doesn't have the same functionality, but I think you can work around with macros or something. You can. I mean, I've, I've got Reaper and I actually use it for some special effects work, but for straight recording, I really don't like it. Um, they were I, trying it out at Audible for a while. I don't know if they're still using it. It might, it, it might be just that I wasn't familiar with it and I've been using Audition for so long. It was really, really, uh, you know, it was a completely different way of recording. But yeah. uh, it does have a similar kind of way you can set things up in different tracks and, and the way it, it records is, is, is kind of interesting. And it's, it's probably more reminiscent of the way Pro Tools does it versus Audition. Yeah. And I know people have used uh, Sony Vegas to narrate yeah. in. I never well, have. Yeah, I don't know. Huh. I don't see why you couldn't. I, I use it to do uh, video stuff, but I haven't. Yeah, well, that's what it's for, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it has audio features, and I know people that have used it as well. It's good stuff. But I know, I, and I know, I have a friend of mine who, she got Audacity because it was free, and she learned how to use it, and she sees no reason to pay the man any more money than she has to, so, you know, 
you're making a WAV file, you're making a WAV file. It's fine if you know how to na- uh, na- um, navigate around in it. Yeah, I, I started out using Audacity, and uh, it has basically the same features that Audition does, but the interface isn't as slick, I guess you right. could say. So. Yeah. So the, 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 uh, the only thing about Pro Tools is it works better on a Macintosh than it does on a PC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm about to find that out myself. <laughs> it, and we, we had problems at Audible. They had, at Audible, they, had, they started a little program a year ago, a little over a year, maybe two years ago now, where they had in-house, and I did one of these, an in-house uh, self-record contract. So instead of paying you by the book, they pay you on a, based on how many recorded hours over a length of time, and they had a three-month contract, and they put these solo booths up in their studio. And so you could sit in a little three-by-five booth with a keyboard and a monitor and a mic and record yourself, and, they, and then uh, as long as you came up with the requisite amount of finished hours per week, over 13 weeks, you would get paid the amount they promised to pay you. But they were using PCs with Pro Tools 10 or 11, and the software created so many anomalies and glitches that it just became a nightmare because then I had twice as many corrections as normal because the computer was doing half of them. It was very problematic. That's why, they, that's why they wanted to try out Reaper. I don't know if they came up with a final solution to that or not. But yeah, so beware your PC and Pro Tools, I'm just saying. Yeah. I'll be looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about all we had for you. We, uh, we've run considerably longer than we expected, but that's okay. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add, David? Um, I don't know. I'll just say that one of the keys to audiobook narration, I think, is being a good actor. Oh, yes. I would agree. Uh-huh. Um, and so people, you know, if, and, and, and the voiceover work in general, being a good actor is key, and being a good actor works in all mediums, and you can learn to adjust to the medium, but having some uh, acting technique and, and some acting talent will only do you favors. The other thing is, if you, can, if, if you do it because you love it, because if you just want a career and make money, and there's anything else you enjoy doing, you should go do that. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Whatever you, if there's something you really love to do that will make you a decent living, you should do that, because if you really love to do acting, you probably still aren't going to make a lot of money at it. You'll always have to do something else anyway, unless you're lucky. And you, you know, people pop through here and there now and then, but uh, most of us just uh, are middle class struggling to make it people. So you do it because you love it. If you love it, do it. And if I tell you don't do it and you do it anyway, that means you should do it. (laughs) That's my, that's always my test. It's like, if I tell you no and you listen to me, I've done you a favor. If I tell you no and you do it anyway, then you know who you are. That's good. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, thanks for listening to my books. I appreciate it greatly. I have no, you know, I don't get, the only feedback I get is when I go on my Audible page and I see if people review the books and they actually like them. Other than that, I have no idea. Um, so well, hopefully this will help expose some more of that. I hope so. Yep. Yeah. You science fiction, you, you Neil Asher fans out there. There's six Neil Asher books under my name. Go listen to them. Actually, they're good books. There so far. I'm, I'm hoping you get grid linked. They haven't given that. That's grid linked. And I'm actually listen, looking forward to hopefully getting Brass Man because I read he, he, shows up in the, he shows up in a couple of other books. And actually in one of the books, which one was it? Line War, I think. One I just did. Um, the Brass Man. What's his name? Mr. Crane. Mr. Crane, the big brass golem. He was in it. And he was great. And it's like, oh, there's a whole book about him. I want to I read that one. I'm going to have to look into Neil Asher because I'm a, I'm a huge sci-fi fan. So I'll have to definitely take a look. They're like galactic, galactic wars. And some of them are more, some of them more shoot them up than others. Um, mm-hmm. And the further you get in, I think the further you get into the, the, poly, the, the later polity books and the later Agent Cormac books, um, the more balanced they are between story and, and blow them up stuff. But they're good, you know, if you like that stuff. Yeah. As long as the, as long as the characters are well-developed and they actually like fill out the storyline then I'm good with reading it. My favorite, part, my favorite part of those books has been the war drones because yes. they're, they're described as being a little off kilter and not quite, you know, all together. Yep. Uh-huh. And so I've been giving them all the, you notice, I give them all these sort of New York and character voices because they're a little wacky. 
Well, I think we're going to have to call it there. We're about a half an hour over our original estimated time, but uh, that's all right. And uh, David, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, guys. Cool. Excellent. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, man. Take care. Peace. That's the show for today. Again, our guest was actor and voiceover artist David Morantz. You can find more about David at his website, www.davidmorantz.com. We've also included links to David's IMDb and Audible page and encourage you to check out his work. And if you're a science fiction fan, I highly recommend you listen to his narration of Neil Asher's polity books that start with Praetor Moon and Shadow of the Scorpion. You won't be disappointed. I'm Peter Reynolds, and thank you for listening to the Vocal Booth Podcast. We'll see you again next time.